This lecture is going to be on double slit and single slit diffraction interference. So we're going to pull a lot on last lecture when we learned about diffraction. Keeping track of where we are in our objectives, we are finishing up the last two objectives here, qualitatively describing diffraction patterns formed when plane waves are incident, normally on a single slit, and then quantitatively describing double slit interference intensity patterns and today we will be deriving an equation for double slit. You should be familiar with the derivation, but you probably will not have to reproduce it. This is going to be our last topic in the SL topics for this unit. Taking a look at the equations that we've learned so far, we have covered all of the equations except for this guy right here. And that's what we're going to be deriving today. So let's take a look for a little warm-up problem to remind you of what we talked about last class. I would like you to read this problem, try it on your own, pause the video, and then play it again to check your answer. Checking your answer, you should have um, predicted that this would be a quiet spot. Noticing that the path length difference, or 5 lambda minus 3.5 lambda, yields a path length difference of 1.5 lambda, we know that any half wavelength multiple is going to be destructive interference, destructive corresponding to a quiet spot. You in fact could solve for the wavelength knowing that um, the person was standing at these distances from the different sources. You could find the wavelength both in terms of meters as well as before we found it in terms of lambda. Setting those two, two equal to each other and solving for lambda, you find the wavelength of 0.6 meters. Again, this should be review from last lecture. So far, we have been focusing on problems like this, where there are two sources that are emitting sound waves or water waves. Today, though, we're going to be looking at two slits and eventually a single slit that is letting light waves through. So we're going to make a transition here to, instead of looking at sources, we're going to look at slits that kind of serve as sources. And instead of looking at sound or water waves, we're now going to be focusing on light waves. So you could imagine if you were to um, create an experiment where you had a laser or a light bulb or some light source that is sending light through two slits, you might think that you would see this guy on the left. But in reality, when you send a laser beam through two different slits, you get this kind of crazy pattern. I absolutely love teaching double slit because it starts to push on this idea of like, what is light? And light being both a particle and a wave. You can see in this particular drawing, you can see that it is both a wave and you can also see, alternatively, that it is a particle. A little play on words visually here. Okay. So this starts to get into particle wave duality of light, which is a super cool topic. So I want to pause here and show you this video on double slit experiments. <laughs> We can get a pretty good feel for the double slit experiment and how dramatically it alters our picture of reality by carrying out a similar experiment, not on the scale of tiny particles, but on the scale of more ordinary objects like those you'd find here in a bowling alley. But first, I need to make a couple of adjustments to the lane. You'd expect that if I roll a few of these balls down the lane, they'll either be stopped by the barrier or pass through one or the other slit and hit the screen at the back. And in fact, that's just what happens. Those balls that make it through always hit the screen directly behind either the left slit or the right slit. The double slit experiment was much like this, except instead of bowling balls, you use electrons, which are billions of times smaller. You can picture them like this. 
Let's see what happens if I throw a bunch of these balls. When electrons are hurled at the two slits, something very different happens on the other side. Instead of hitting just two areas, the electrons land all over the detector screen, creating a pattern of stripes, including some right between the two slits, the very place you'd think would be blocked. So what's going on? Well, to physicists, even in the 1920s, this pattern could mean only one thing. Waves. Waves do all kinds of interesting things, things that bowling balls would never do. They can split. They can combine. If I sent a wave of water through the double slits, it would split in two, and then the two sets of waves would intersect. Their peaks and valleys would combine, getting bigger in some places, smaller in others, and sometimes they cancel each other out. With the height of the water corresponding to brightness on the screen, the peaks and valleys would create a series of stripes in what's known as an interference pattern. So how could electrons, which are particles, form that pattern? How could a single electron end up in places a wave would go? Particles are particles, waves are waves. How can a particle be a wave? Unless you give up the idea that it's a particle and think, aha, this thing that I thought was a particle was actually a wave. A wave in an ocean? That's not a particle. The ocean is made out of particles, but the waves in the ocean are not particles. And rocks are not waves. Rocks are rocks. So a rock is an example of a particle. An ocean wave is an example of an ocean wave. And now somebody's telling you a rock is like an ocean wave. What? Back in the 1920s, when a version of this experiment was first done, scientists struggled to understand this wavy behavior. Some wondered if a single electron, while in motion, might spread out into a wave. And the physicist Erwin Schrodinger came up with an equation that seemed to describe it. Schrodinger thought that this wave was a description of an extended electron, that somehow an electron got smeared out and uh, it was no longer a point, but was like a mush. There was a lot of argument about exactly what this represented. Finally, a physicist named Max Born came up with a new and revolutionary idea for what the wave equation described. Born said the wave is not a smeared out electron or anything else previously encountered in science. Instead, he declared it's something that's really peculiar, a probability wave. That is, Born argued that the size of the wave at any location predicts the likelihood of the electron being found there. Where the wave is big, that's not where most of the electron is. That's where the electron is most likely to be. And that's just very strange, right? So the electron on its own seems to be a jumble of possibilities. You're not allowed to ask, where is the electron right now? You are allowed to ask, if I look for the electron in this little particular part of space, what is the likelihood I will find it there? I mean, that bugs anyone, <laughs> anytime. Okay, for the sake of time, we are gonna pause that video there. And I highly encourage you to watch the rest. It gets into probability waves and Schrodinger's equation, some really, really cool physics. However, I wanna bring us back down to what we're actually focused on in IB physics. So I wanna bring us back to a video that we actually watched a little bit in our previous lecture. It's called the original double slit experiment. Let's take a look. Could I possibly interview you guys for about a minute? Sure. We're doing a science experiment. What I have here is an empty box. Mm -hmm. And this is a little eyepiece where we can look in. And this is a hole. And I'm going to place this slide above that hole. And if you look closely, you'll see that there's two openings. Very yep. narrow openings side by side. It's a double slit. Now, before we have a look, we need to tilt it towards the sun a little bit. So mm -hmm. we want the sun to hit 
this double slit directly. What are we going to see on the bottom well, of the box? The obvious thing you, you think you're going to see is you're going to see two, two lines. Two lines on the bottom of the box. And two bright bands. Two little lines. Then, yeah. yeah. I think it'll be one one line instead of two. I could expect to see the whole box lit up. It'll probably be a kaleidoscope of some sort. A bunch of colours. Probably, yeah. Rainbow. There, have a look. You expected to see kind of one line. Is that what you see? No. I see dots. How many? It's one circle. Well, there's one, there's one in the middle strongest, two either side. The two on the outside are multicolored, and the one in the middle is just white. It's kind of a rainbow. The rainbow of color as well. Quite a few colors, and lots of little dots. Like there are more dots appearing. I think I can even see more dots spreading along. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, I can see tons of dots now. Not tons, but I can see dots spreading across uh, that way. Either side. Yeah, definitely. So what they're actually seeing inside of that box is a version of this more sophisticated setup that you're going to see in this video. This is using a laser instead of sunlight. And you can see that um, it's on kind of this optical board and the slit is very precise. And so this is the interference pattern that you would see if we were able to do this lab in school. I'd encourage you to check out the full video to see how he manipulates the laser setup in order to get different infer interference patterns. For example, just fast forwarding, this interference pattern is much more spread out. And the link to that video can be found in my notes right here. So let's go ahead and take a look at the derivation for the double slit equation. Okay, so here is my setup. We have our double slits over here. We have kind of slit one and slit two. And these slits are gonna serve as the sources of light. Think about um, before when we were talking about like speaker one and speaker two, these are kind of sources of independent light waves. Even though back here, there's like a laser that's shooting light kind of going through both of them. Over here, we have a screen that screen is showing the intensity pattern kind of with these squiggles. And then in two dimensions, you would see something like this. So you would see a really bright center spot, and then you would see a dark spot, another bright spot, a dark spot, a bright spot, and so on. So the first thing, I'm gonna start this derivation by drawing in a line. That line is going to go from the middle of the slits over to my screen. And I'm going to label this line capital D. I'm going to keep track of the variables that I'm labeling down here. Capital D is going to be the distance between the slits and the screen. And then I'm going to focus in on our second brightest. So I'm talking about right here. I'm gonna focus in on that second brightest fringe. Fringe is just another fancy way of saying where that second brightness is. So I'm gonna draw in another line here. I'm gonna draw it in from the center of the slits to that next brightest fringe, okay? Now I have an important variable that I'm gonna label. I am gonna call the distance from the central brightest fringe up to my first brightest fringe, I'm gonna call that S, okay? So I'll keep track of that down here. S is going to be the distance from brightest fringe to second brightest. And so you can kind of think of this angle right here you can think of this angle, I'll label it theta, that angle kind of being like the angular distance from the first fringe to the second fringe. And so I want to outline this triangle here because it's going to become important in just a moment. This triangle right here that has S as one side, D as another side, and this angle theta in between. Notice that there is a right angle over here. Next, I'm gonna draw a few more um, lines in that are gonna help us with the second part of our derivation. These lines are gonna go from your slit over to that brightest spot. And I'll do that for both of my slits here. So from the slit 
to that brightest spot. Okay. And then I'm going to draw another line in it that is perpendicular between the two lines that I just drew. Something like this. Draw it as best I can to be perpendicular. Okay, so there is a 90 degree angle here. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit and I want to focus in on this triangle right here. I'm going to highlight that triangle in red. We have a 90 degree angle right there in the triangle. This angle right here is actually the same theta that we drew before. You can prove that to yourself geometrically, but for the sake of time, I'm not going to go through that proof. The other important thing to note here is this side of the triangle, I'm going to call little d, okay? And little d is going to stand for the distance between the slits. That is like how far apart the slits are from each other. So I'm going to zoom back into our little triangle. And I want you to notice that these lines that I've drawn, um, this line right here, this is going to be the distance from one slit to that bright spot. This is essentially going to be one path. You could imagine what we've done before is we place a human somewhere and they listen to the sound coming from two sources. So that's going to be one of the paths, and this guy is going to be the other path to that human. So this little area right here, right in here, this little area is actually the path length difference. The path length difference. Okay. It's as if we took this top line, and this bottom line, and we subtracted the two, we would get the path length difference. Now, because I chose to focus in on the first brightest spot, I know that this path length difference is going to be one lambda. That's going to be my first constructive line. Remember, the primary line, right, um, the big bump in the middle would be zero lambda, but in this case, it's simply one lambda for my first brightest. Okay. So at this point, I have these two triangles set up, the, the triangle that's highlighted in blue and the triangle that's highlighted in red. I'm going to copy those down below. Okay, so I've copied my blue and red triangle down below and I've carried my variables with it. You can see that we have similar triangles here because they share in common that theta. I'm going to use some trigonometry in order to kind of parse out what's happening. I see in my blue triangle that using tangent of theta would make sense because tangent is the opposite over adjacent. And in my red triangle, a sine theta would make the most sense because sine theta is going to be opposite lambda over hypotenuse, little d. I'm going to make an assumption here. I'm going to assume that the small angle approximation, you may have heard of that in math, the small angle approximation, can be applied here. And the small angle approximation says that the tangent of theta is approximately equal to theta itself. And it also says that the sine of theta is approximately equal to theta itself, as long as that theta is small. So that means that over here, my tangent theta equals s over d is going to simplify to just theta equals s over d. And on my red triangle, sine theta equals lambda over d it simplifies to be theta equals lambda over d. Careful, there's a big d and a small d running around here. So I'm going to take these two equations, since they are both theta equals something, and I'm going to combine them. That s over d equals lambda over little d, essentially just saying theta must equal theta. I'll rearrange this just a little bit more, bringing that big D to the other side. And I do that so that this equation will look exactly like what is in your data booklet. So in summary, we have just derived this equation, S equals lambda capital D over little d. Capital D stands for the distance from the slits to the screen. 
S stands for the distance from the brightest fringe to the second brightest fringe. Little d stands for the distance between the slits, and lambda, of course, stands for wavelength. Now, one really important thing to notice is that we did make that approximation, the small angle approximation. So this equation will only work if our theta that we use in our derivation is indeed really, really small. And in order to accomplish a small enough angle, this means that our wavelength Much, must be much, much smaller than the distance between the slits. Or in terms of our variable, our lambda needs to be much, much smaller than lowercase d. So this is really important to keep in mind that you will only be able to apply this equation if wavelength is much, much less than the distance between the slits. The final thing I want to talk about today is the single slit experiment. Now for SL, we're just going to talk about it qualitatively, but HLers, you're going to go on to actually um, understand the equation behind a single slit experiment. So take a look at this comparison. On the top is a single slit pattern and on the bottom is a double slit pattern. You may notice some differences that the double slit seems to have kind of this extra interference but it all kind of fits within the single slit pattern. Let's take a look at that intensity pattern. Again, single slit is on the left and double slit is on the right. And you can see that double slit fits inside of the single slit. And we call this the single slit, it's a single slit envelope. So a single slit experiment would simply give you that envelope outline and then the double slit kind of adding that slit adds this more granulated interference in between. In fact, adding three slits, four slits, five slits, keep making the interference pattern more complex, but always fitting into that single slit envelope. So at this point, I want you to try to apply this equation in a gear up problem. Pause the video here, solve it, and push play to check your answer. And checking the gear up problem using our equation and correctly using the variables to identify the givens, you should indeed be able to show that the distance between the first and the second fringes on the screen is about 0.002 meters.